we're just the backside, make sure it all works out. So hopefully you guys enjoy tonight, and uh, I'll hand it back over. All right, thank you for coming, everyone. I didn't expect to be this many people to come, actually. Right. Uh, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of shout out. So thank you so much for uh, Professor Cheryl and Professor David to actually guide us to create this event and make it successful. I also want to shout out for the speakers that actually want to spare their, some of their time to actually talk about their experiences. And also want to do a shout out for the HSA to actually provide us this space and also the food later because we're broke, two broke students who couldn't afford the food for everyone. <laughs> right. So I'm just going to pass it on to Professor Cheryl and please enjoy. Cheryl Bolton, and uh, this is a, uh, a really good panel discussion uh, for me too because I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I've done a lot of fundraising and grown uh, several companies from just an idea to real life sustainable companies, which is always a good feeling. I know several people here <laughs> have done that as well. Um, you know, we, we're in a very special place, which is Silicon Valley. Um, it, we here in Silicon Valley like big ideas and uh, new ideas and we, <clears throat> contrary to popular opinion, we don't emphasize failure, we emphasize success. But we all know that here that failure is a part of the learning process and it's part of the road um, to success. As Hap calls it, it's the secret sauce, and I'll let you explain, of Silicon Valley, I'll let you explain and expand on that, explain and expand on it a little bit later. Uh, you know, research has shown, uh, there's been quite a bit of research on how long does it take for an entrepreneur to become successful. And the research right now is 2.7 tries before success, <laughs> on average, <laughs> occurs. Um, and I personally can totally uh, identify with that. The uh, research used to say it took two tries, and that was uh, that sounded about right to me. And I've uh, been interested to find out why is it, you know, moving faster? Why does it take more tries? And I think I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that technology is so much cheaper today than it used to be. You've got the cloud for computing and for storage, and it's a lot easier to get an MVP out there and test it and see if it works. And sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but you learn it pretty fast, whereas in the past you used to take a lot of time and consequently a lot of money to be able to try a new idea. So we're in a very different place uh, with a lot of even more new things happening. Um, and I know Hap will talk about uh, unicorns and that kind of stuff that's happening as well. So we have more and more opportunities uh, for learning uh, what to do, but also learning what not to do. Um, part of that is moving you know, to plan B or C or M or Z. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we like to call that pivoting, but it's it's the old idea of showing resilience and looking at things from a very different point of view. Um, understanding our customers a lot better, the nuances of what the problems are and what the solutions can be. So our parent panel knows about all of these kinds of things and uh, we're going to uh, begin the discussion uh, by letting me introduce each one of the panelists. Uh, first, it's Hap Clock, you might want to raise your hand, which I think most people here know you, but uh, Hap was the CEO of North Face for uh, 20 years. He's um, also been an adventurer, an executive, a board member, an author, and a professor here, uh, and many other places too. Um, Anne Coquette is a serial entrepreneur who founded the first uh, AI-driven um, women's networking platform, the Guild, and comes with lots of experience launching and funding startups in a variety of industries. And then Guillaume de Dodo is the founder of Startup Basecamp, where he has raised more than $1 million for startups that they've hosted. And we also have Tobias Mikkelsen, some of you may know Tobias, who uh, graduated from Paul a couple years ago and has started, um, well, first of all, I think you've been an entrepreneur all your life, it looks like, <laughs> and has uh, recently started Done, which offers customized, uh, fully customized uh, website development within just 24 hours. And I know there's a lot more that you can say about that. 
but I'll let you in the networking time. So we're going to have a discussion about um, how failure contributes to success, and then we'll have a Q&A, and then we'll adjourn to all the snacks over there and meet each other um, and do a little networking. Um, so I'd like to uh, start the conversation by um, asking uh, Hap, since you're first in line here, <laughs> you, get, you get the brunt. Um, can you expand on that idea that uh, failure is the secret sauce of Silicon Valley? What does that mean? Glad to do it. Uh, the, thank you, Cheryl. One of the things that's really unique about this area of the world, Silicon Valley, which is probably 50 miles around the area here, is that it's okay to fail in Silicon Valley. And that is something that is unusual. Those of you who come from other countries know I, I've run businesses in New Zealand, I've uh, run one in, in northern UK, and if you fail there, you're screwed. Uh, your family uh, is affected, everybody knows everything about you. In Silicon Valley, for a lot of reasons, that doesn't happen. The first one is most of the businesses in Silicon Valley are started by immigrants that come from other places, they have very little family network. Uh, so the risk taker by nature because they've left to come here. The second thing is if they fail, it doesn't reflect on the family as much, it doesn't reflect on anything else. Uh, also, this is an area of the world that's always been populated by risk takers. If you think back to 1840s, all the people that came here, came here for riches. They came here for the gold strike. If you go to the East Coast, the reason that people populated the East Coast was religious freedom. Entirely different mentality. Uh, so we've had a history of that for a long time. What that allows is a very interesting mentality, and that is that if you want to grow a really large business, you have to take risk. And if you don't want to fail, you cut the risk down. And so in, a, in an environment that says it's okay to take risk, you can shoot for the moon. Hence, 50% of the unicorns that exist in the world exist in Silicon Valley. You all know about Steve Jobs. Uh, do you know about Mark Andreessen? Mark founded Netscape. Um, Jack Dorsey founded Twitter. Max Levichin started PayPal with Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. The thing that they all have in common is they were kicked out of those companies that I talked about. And yet they all come back to be huge successes. And they were funded by other people. Uh, in the case of uh, Steve Jobs, he couldn't play well with others. Uh, he was modestly better when he came back, but they kicked him out. In the case of Mark Andreessen, he said, listen, our patents are better than Microsoft, so we're going to kill them. And the board finally said, listen, your patents may be better, but who normally wins a patent battle is the one with the most money. Microsoft has a lot more money than we do. We can't have you with that mentality. Peter Thiel uh, couldn't get along with, uh, with Elon Musk, could not get along with Max Levinson, so Max now runs Yelp and, and uh, Slide and some other companies, and Elon, we know what he's doing. But the reality is it's okay here. And in fact, there's some people I know that run major venture capital companies in Silicon Valley that have told me they will not invest in a company unless they actually see that some of the management has failure on their resume. Why, why would that be? Well, the first one is you, you gain a little bit of humility when you failed, and that, that doesn't hurt in terms of dealing with it. The second one is you learn to make really quick decisions based on real, intuitive experience, not on theory. If somebody has not habit, they sit around and theorize about what's happening. Somebody who's been there and done it says, listen, you know, I don't have all the details, but I know we've got to get out. And as a result of that, it changes the environment quite a bit. I was told by a couple of those large VCs, I was asking about business plans. We all kind of know from the business world that we really have to develop a business plan. And I asked them what they thought about it. They said, oh, they're great. We never read them. I said, why is that? So said, we want to know they can develop a business plan. What we also know is no business plan is very good at forecasting the future. What really happens is you've got to pivot and change. And what we are interested in is the people. Do they have the capacity to develop the next plan when they hit the wall on the first plan? Or do they have the capacity to cancel what they're doing and get out of it quickly to be able to, to do that? This a theory here is you know, fail fast, fail forward. Don't worry about the failure. Uh, it was Edison who said, you know, I've, I've never failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that something doesn't work. 
this mentality you have to have. And all of the thinking that you see out here, design thinking, is about rapid MVP development and getting out of things. So you have that mentality here. It's okay to take a shot for the moon. If you miss, you come back. You're stronger, you're more resilient. You don't tuck your head down and say, oh my gosh, I'll never do it again. What you say is I've learned a lot and I'm going to apply it. Well, you may not feel so great uh, right after it happens, but I think what we're talking about here is the ability to have grit and uh, resilience. Yep. So, um, Tobias, what's been your experience uh, in Scandinavia compared to Silicon Valley now that you're starting? Um, so, should I have a mic? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I, I basically founded uh, two companies in in uh, Norway before I came to to San Francisco. Uh, the first one was an app development company, and I remember. Uh, I mean, I was I was very young, but for both companies, talking about failure, that's one thing that I remember. You know, thinking a lot about, um, worrying that. I would uh, that I would fail, and how that could impact my reputation locally. Maybe particularly because I'm from a country where, uh, you know, the region where I grew up has a relatively low population. Uh, generally, a lot most people know each other in in those local communities. So, um, you know, if if you do something wrong and and uh, it's it's clear. Everyone knows, uh, and I think I think that's a, a, a big difference. And, and I think I think that might be one of the causes for why uh, you know places like Scandinavia have a more difficult time for for other parts of Europe as as well. Um, in smaller communities, um, have a, a more difficult time building entrepreneurial environments, if you will. Because you don't really see a lot of startups in, in small cities, maybe anywhere, but at least not where I'm from, that I know for sure. So get to a bigger city. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's and, actually a big thing. And sure. what about um, other parts of Europe? I know Europe and Germany, you've been involved with startups both here and there. So uh, are you seeing differences? Um, that you can share? Yeah, absolutely. Since most of our audience comes from not from Silicon right. Valley, but Who's from Europe here? Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> South, South America, Latin America? Whoa. Okay. Asia? Africa? Okay. Australia? <laughs> awesome. Wow, very international. Well, so the Europeans, I don't have to tell you this, but risk taking in Europe, and especially in Germany, where I'm from, that is like, that has a completely different value than it has here, right? And I was always a natural risk taker in some way. I love doing new things, I have new ideas, I'm an explorer, I want to do things, I'm creative. And people would always say, oh no, you can't do that. Or no, there's a million things, writers will fail. And I always felt so, so dragged down. And, and then seven years ago, when I came to Silicon Valley and I had a few ideas and we had this Consumer product company idea, my husband and I, all of a sudden I went to these events and everybody lit up when I told them about my idea. And I, yeah, that's awesome, and I'm gonna connect you with this other person. And there's somebody who did something similar and you should talk. And people didn't expect anything in return. So that was a complete 180 degree culture change from you know, a very transactional, very negative culture in Europe, in Germany, and then also in Switzerland, to then being here. So for me, that was like a sip of water after a long journey in the desert. And, and so ever since then, I mean, I love Silicon Valley, and I've, I've failed forward many, many times, but it is a huge cultural issue. So now you're sitting here, and you're from those countries, and probably want to go back at some point. What do you do with that, right? You can't export the culture from here necessarily to your to your countries. So I don't have the answer to that, but I think now that we have a global community and a community of entrepreneurs globally, you can find those places where you get that fresh sip of water and you can find that support online in groups and in communities. 
And that's one of the reasons why I founded a global community for entrepreneurs, because I think it's so important to have that spirit, not just in one little tiny part of the world or small hubs everywhere in the world, like Tel Aviv and Berlin have, have that certainly too, but um, export that into the global realm. And um, I can tell you in Switzerland, when I left consulting, you know, big IT consulting job, very boring, and I said, oh, I'm an artist, and I want to start my art work company. I mean, everybody was like, you can't do that. And actually, they were right. I failed horribly at that business, and I learned a ton. But I would not want to miss that experience of having been in a, at that Christmas market, freezing my off and, and, and selling my, my artwork. And you know, now, 10 years later, I, I still have so many learnings from that experience. So you know, like my, my advice would be find the tribes. And I think HALT here has an amazing tribe that you can connect with also in the future with alumni to have that spirit and take that spirit also to your cities. Hey, Yom, I know you're from Belgium, you said. So you also have had probably some of these same experiences. What are uh, your reflections on the differences? And maybe also, uh, is there a way to overcome or to broaden the uh, the mentality to uh, accept failure in other parts of the world? Yeah, that's as, as a learning device. That, definitely, and, uh, and I think more than just uh, being from Belgium, uh, we started this camp, we hosted more than 2,000 entrepreneurs and startups from all around the world. So I had a chance to be uh, really like facing uh, all of those dreamers uh, coming here to Silicon Valley. And you're lucky you're here today. Uh, I don't know how many of you are already starting a company, how many of you maybe are thinking of a company, maybe if you can just hands up. And there's a few entrepreneurs here, that's fantastic. So for those ones, congrats. Uh, but I think uh, one of the most important things is all about execution. Uh, the idea is great, uh, and I think we all have uh, plenty of ideas. Uh, but what I saw, it's really like execution and network. Uh, when I see all of those entrepreneurs coming over, they're all like thinking Silicon Valley is the place to be. It is. It is an amazing place. Uh, there is, as you guys mentioned, there's a lot of like this openness uh, mentality. But I think which is very important, it's like when you arrive, you need to be prepared. You prepare yourself. You execute and you try to meet as many as possible and then you get out of here. Why? It's too expensive. <laughs> it's way too expensive. How, how much do you pay for your rent? Do you want to stay here? Do you want to burn the money off? No, come here, back and forward. And that's what I saw really that was working for some of our entrepreneurs. It's really coming here for three weeks, a month, get inspired, get feedback as much as they can on their ID. And hear that in fact a lot of stuff that they were thinking was like changing the world, was maybe not for Silicon Valley, or was absolutely not what they should go. So feeling this failure and this like really like touching the reality because entrepreneurs usually are dreamers as well. And we all dream about the perfect baby, but it's only when the baby is out and you start to build it that the baby becomes something, that your company starts to grow. And that's why you're gonna realize that maybe you need to go on that side, on that side. And that's how uh, this mentality is very unique here. Uh, back, in, uh, back in Europe, uh, but also when I saw people from Asia, Asia is also like an amazing country in terms of like uh, innovation. I think China has been more innovative than sometimes Silicon Valley can be as of today. And I think it's interesting to look at what's happening there. But also the way how they express themselves. When they come here, there's this whole cultural shock to understand how we do business in America. And I think this, all of those experiences, like you are lucky to come here. I think you're really lucky to be uh, with this program at all. You're not alone. You have peers, you have like events, you have like uh, teacher organizing uh, and, and sharing a lot with you. So I'm speaking a lot, I don't know if I'm deviating from the, the well, question, but. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, you said something that resonated with me. Certainly, I remember one of the first companies I started, um, I thought the idea was everything. And somebody uh, kind of jolted me by saying, I couldn't believe it. How can he possibly say ideas are a dime a dozen? <laughs> My idea. <laughs> but um, I came to realize that uh, in Silicon Valley and in other centers of entrepreneurial activity, um, 
you, it's, it's a good thing to be very open with your idea because execution is everything. And uh, it's great to start with a good idea. You usually change it, modify it, and you're going to, you know, it's going to be how you do it. So along those lines, what do you see are the kind of biggest mistakes that, uh, that people are making? Um, uh, several of you are involved with a number of companies. Can we start that off? You see a big mistake, a couple of mistakes in general, pattern? Well, the, the big one I see is sort of perfection paralysis. And that is you know, intellectually and partly because of fear, people try to develop a business that's going to be perfect. As I said earlier, uh, very few businesses follow the original business plan. They have to pivot again and again. And I think Voltaire is the one who said it best, that said that uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Good oftentimes is what you really need to do because we're living in a time of accelerating change, exponential accelerating change. And we've gotten to the point where there's not time for perfect information. So we have to take risk and make decisions before we know what the outcome is going to be. Increases the prospect of failure, but it's worthwhile doing that. But if you're paralyzed by trying to seek the perfect thing and plan everything at the beginning, you'll never get started. And in today's world, there aren't that many ideas that are totally unique where there's somebody else looking at it. And the first mover advantage is a big advantage. Um, on the other hand, uh, Jim has to point out that uh, often VCs certainly are not to fund are looking for growth markets, and they like it when there's more than one company. It doesn't have to be exactly the same idea, but uh, the same going after the same growth market because it's a validation kind of thing. And that also is something to learn that um, I know often uh, folks that I've dealt with from uh, other places in the world want to be the only person and never tell who, who does, has a certain idea and never tell anybody about it. That's a, a sure way not to get anything going. <laughs> anybody else, Tobias? Got any? Um, yeah, there was, there was one thing that came to mind, and I think uh, Hap might have touched on this uh, in one of the lectures that I attended uh, while I was at Holt. Um, that is, you know, talking about perfection and um, having competitors that are similar to you. Um, my experience, well, I, I've sort of uh, looked at, see, look at look at Steve Jobs, for example, and Apple, um, how most of their products were actually based off on um, at least their existed products that were very similar to what they wanted to do or what Apple ended up doing with, for example, the mouse, uh, which became you know fundamental to computers later on. Uh, Someone else had, had invented a different company, uh, had used the mouse for something, for a completely different purpose, um, and, uh, and they hadn't seen the value in commercializing it, and uh, somehow Steve Jobs took that uh, opportunity and, and brought it uh, to the computer. Not just that, um, also, I mean, even, even the first Mac was really Steve Jobs taking something that he saw uh, from his his friend um, Wozniak, who had built something he didn't realize the value in. Uh, so you know, looking around online, uh, if if you're if you're building something like like what I'm building, which is an online platform, a SaaS uh, platform, looking at what others have done, uh, and maybe also where others have failed, have been very effective just for those reasons uh, that. You, you can really, you can really see um, the potential in other people's inventions or other people's ideas. And you know, one thing about Silicon Valley that is also very different from other places in the world, and it, at least Norway, um, is that you don't always have to sign an NDA to get to learn about people's products or ideas. Uh, people are actually very open to talking, talk about them. They have to be. Yeah. They, they, they do, and it's, uh, I think, part of the, the secret sauce of Silicon Valley as well, that uh, you have that kind of openness and, and people are, are growing off, uh, growing growing in other people's ideas as well. It doesn't have to mean that you're copying it, but you're learning from others as well. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's important and a major difference probably between Silicon Valley and most other places in the world. And one thing also that was mentioned in terms of like that we're in America, uh, you know, one th I've been to meetings now around around the country. Uh, you realize that Silicon Valley is not really 
um, doing business in America. It, it, it's uh, there are very different business cultures in different parts of the country, uh, even in Boston, which is sort of similar to Silicon Valley in the sense that, uh, but, but it, and, and New York as well. We have a lot of, of startups, but they're not similar exactly yet. So uh, yeah, yeah, those were my thoughts there. I would add that actually the biggest mistake you can make is not to talk to customers early on. And you don't know how often I'm in a lift car and somebody pitches me their idea, but they're they're vague about it. And I had actually a lift driver send me an NDA afterwards because I gave her my email address that I want you to to assign this NDA. And it was about recycling or something. It was a good idea. But you know, like if you don't talk to those people early, early on, you're missing out on so much great. Uh, feedback and um, at Genentech when I was in the innovation team we were looking at these pill adherence bottles that were pill reminders for lung cancer patients and um, three months into the pilot we distributed these pill bottles and everything was approved etc and then guess what happened the lung cancer patients couldn't hear the high-pitched noise that the pill bottle made because for us, it was a very annoying tone, so you wanted to go open it, take your pills. But a lung cancer patient, on average, is about 60 years old, and they can't hear that high pitch anymore. So what if we had just taken this pill bottle, put some M&Ms in it, and taken it to our grandpas or you know our families, and just tested it? And we could have learned a lot from those kinds of things, but people are very focused in their labs, on their experiments, same with Alexa, right? Alexa couldn't understand female voices in the first iteration because the, the labs were full of guys, so they didn't uh, tune her for the higher pitched voices. And and you know, this is millions of dollars later that you have to fix and your product may fail completely because you're not talking to people. It's not, it's not just bad. startups either. I think the Boeing uh, disaster is uh, yeah partly a result of not including pilots and uh, reactions to the development team's work. So a lot of what we're talking about really is applicable not only to entrepreneurial situations, but to work in any uh, corporate environment, uh, as a matter of fact. So, you know, we've been talking a lot now uh, abstractly about failure and success and things like that. Um, and so I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you think of any, um, you don't have to tell me your worst failure. <laughs> you can tell me one of them, maybe. <laughs> I uh, started thinking about this for myself, and I immediately had quite a long list. <laughs> just in case you, did we need a moment of silent meditation or anything? Or can you just jump in? <laughs> yeah, ready? Yeah. Uh, a series of recoveries. You always live on that knife edge between wonderful success and failure. Uh, particularly in an entrepreneurial venture, but in almost anything where you're taking high risk and you're growing. Our biggest and my biggest failure was I had the wrong business model. In the apparel and footwear business, using traditional metrics, you can only grow 20% a year on internally generated funds. And I developed a company that would grow at 100% a year or more. We had teams around that, and that was all the mentality. And so in doing that, what happened was I ended up Moving from training people, enjoying the product, being outdoors, uh, marketing and branding and all of that, and I turned into a poorly paid investment banker for the company, and that was the thing that I least liked to do. And after going through a number of rounds of financing to be able to support this voracious animal we had, we ended up to a point where I didn't enjoy the job, so I sold the company. But there was the right solution that somebody else had figured it out, and that was Phil Knight. And Phil Knight is the founder of, of Nike. And while it's not well known, and even if you read his book, Shoe Dog, it doesn't come out. But what he did is he recognized what I didn't and some others didn't. They could only grow 20% a year. And he said, well, I don't want to lose control of the company. So what he did was go to a vendor. And he went to a company called Nisho Iwa, a Japanese trading company. And he said, you know, you're pushing me for growth, pushing me for growth. You can have it. I'll tell you how you can do that which is instead of providing me eyelets and laces and whatever, 
you buy the product, the finished product on my behalf and sell it to me and we will pay you when we put it on the shelf of the retailer because at that point I can go out and I can get receivables financing. And they said, well, it's interesting, but what happens if you go out of business? He said, well, what I will tell you is we'll do something nobody else in the business is doing and that is we will go out and write forward orders that we will never order one more pair of sneakers than we have written orders for. And we will give you those orders as collateral. And they said, well, that's pretty interesting. He said, of course, you'd get more money than if you sold it to us because we're selling at a higher price. And they said, but we still don't want you to go out of business. And he said, well, to guarantee that, I, I also will tell you we will never go into a new territory on our own money. We will only go in on distributor basis where we can buy the rights back in the future when we go public or do something. And they said, well, that's pretty intriguing, uh, but we're loaning you money. They said, that's okay, because Japanese bank rates are 1%, and our rates at that time are 8%. And they said, you know, charge us 8%. You'll make money on the money you're loaning. You'll be able to grow. We can grow organically at whatever rate we have. And they were highly successful doing it until the point they were in an IPO at which point they paid off Nishiwiwa. Now, the, the follow-on story, and, and at this point, Phil and I is worth 30 or 40 billion dollars. So, so the moral of the story is pivot. Yeah, pivot, <laughs> pivot, and also maybe look at your business not only from a product standpoint or a service standpoint, but look at it from all facets of it. And, and it turned out that probably the, the genius of Phil Knight is not that he's marketing. He had good marketing when he hired Wheaton and Kennedy. What he is is financial genius, and he brought that to bear along with all this marketing and product development. Anybody else want to add to that? I, I, I must say that my uh, all my mis the ones that I thought of immediately were little tiny mistakes compared to that. <laughs> they were like uh, hiring the wrong people, not making decisions fast enough, uh, not getting enough money, uh, getting too much money, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> uh, what have you experienced, Guillaume? Yes, yeah, so I, um, I I remember at the beginning. So we started to uh, we started basically with two different activities. One is hospitality. One is the innovation lab, where we do uh, a lot of like uh, corporate and uh, animation training. And uh, with hospitality, where we started, uh, because when I came here, I was like with two guys, you know, no one in Silicon Valley was struggling to find a place to live, and then I rented an apartment, started to sell it to entrepreneurs and startups, and you know, to have a, place, a good place to live. And then starting to realize that uh, more than just for myself, I could help more entrepreneurs uh, here uh, who are coming and looking for a place to stay, but also connect with other uh, like minded folks. And starting that, we started from an apartment, then we got a loft, second loft, and then we brought the, the concept to, uh, to the concept of co-living hotel and now we have actually uh, location and we partner with uh, in the city. And the, the, one of the mistakes that's been like uh, interesting for us is like a small time we're going and we're like okay we need to manage better our booking uh, and manage in a way the community of guests that we have. And I've always been like uh, a little bit like oh we should be in like a beautiful lab and you're in Silicon Valley why not do that. But we didn't have that much money because so far we work organically and only like uh, as a bootstrap company. So which is pretty exciting to see how many years in San Francisco we have been able to do that. So then, uh, no money, so what do you do to find the cheapest developer if you're not a, a coder yourself? So I started to look and speak around with other friends and you know, ah, these friends in India is amazing and if there is India in the, in the city on the, on the, in the room here, I have nothing against you, but I had a very interesting experience with, uh, with that also sync uh, developing uh, activity. And then I called the guy, and we started explaining him, yeah, so we need a booking system, but also we want to connect like uh, alumni community together, so basically to make the, the whole booking smooth and everything. The guy started saying, okay, I can do that for you, um, $6,000. So, yeah, that's in my project, I think it's uh, totally doable, let's do that. And then we started to work, and uh, what happened is like they got uh, the first uh, um, the first time uh, a house was on fire, and then uh, the internet blocked, and then there was flooding, and then uh, the guy was there was telling me, you know, we did good progress, but uh, we still uh, are behind with this and this, and we ended up by spending probably like 
three months and a half, four months of trusting that we are getting close to what we want to be able to scale and at the end, at the, uh, at the end we're basically burning this old money for nothing yeah. and even paying more. Uh, with like time difference, that was completely insane as well because you know there's uh, probably like ten or different uh, with them. So speaking to them at really you know weird time as well. So everything that never do that, please find a local friend. Exactly. <laughs> but at the end, we just like took uh, existing booking system online and we took a Slack community. We put that together and it was fine. So I think <laughs> this falls under uh, some mistakes that probably all of us have made, and that is uh, choosing uh, the wrong team or parts of the wrong team and yeah. then having to make the decision quickly. Because in an entrepreneurial situation, you really need to make your decision pretty fast if you've made a mistake in people um, because it can slow everything down incredibly or, or have it totally not start even. So do you have a, an example? Yeah. So, to add to all of this, <laughs> um, I actually work with the Ukrainian developer team and I'm very happy with them, but it's also only nine or ten hours, so maybe that's a, that's a trick. Um, I've actually heard some success stories about working with teams yeah. Yeah. elsewhere, so it's not always, it's not always the team, it's the people can, usually. <laughs> absolutely, and, and you know, maybe the, the, the one thing there, the the early burning signs that you see in an interview, they are usually the ones that then turn out to be the big things. So listen to that early on, listen to your intuition. You don't always yes. have the time to go through all these team interviews and things. So that, that's why actually it happens too that our startup teams aren't that diverse because you have to have people that you trust at the very beginning to build your startups. And, um, and you don't have the time to necessarily interview other people and build that trust. For, for me, my biggest challenge is focus. And as entrepreneurs, we need to be explorers. We need to be curious. And that's what makes us great entrepreneurs and innovators. But then once we have one an idea, we really need to focus on the one thing or the one, the one target market or the one disease or whatever it is. And that's really difficult, right? And it's this balance between focus and pivoting and chaos and order and risk, but also being cautious that a lot of entrepreneurs fail at, and I did definitely too. So I started the guild at the same time as I started a pet nutrition company. And it was because I am a mentor at University of San Francisco and I had a group of students and they had this idea and they worked on this and we all worked on it together and then I had an opportunity to actually get funding for it and also acquire another startup in the pet nutrition space and get all their data. And it was very opportunistic. It wasn't connected to my passion and it wasn't connected to anything else. And I thought, oh, how hard can it be to be you know, CEO of two companies and founder of two companies? And you can imagine, an horribly failed the pet nutrition startup, luckily not the guilt, <laughs> but um, you know, the startup is still there. You can still order pet nutrition reports, but you cannot put that much time and effort and energy when you have limited resources in two things at the same time. You know, Jack Dorsey may be able to, but, but well, there's can. some question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think this partly falls under uh, knowing yourself because um, over time you learn uh, a lot about yourself and what you're able to do, want to do, feel passionate about doing. And uh, that doesn't apply to everything that you come up on. And, um, you know, in the beginning, I, I think, you know, you have this feeling you can do any business, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, not so fast. So, um, you know, we're just about, I think, at the point. And did you want to add anything about um, um, what sure. you experienced? Sure. Um, well, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't the founder of this company, but I consider it a, a personal fa failure. Uh, still, I was, I was among the first people to join uh, a startup that, I, that I, I started out as an intern while I was at Holt. So this was my first experience with, with a startup in Silicon Valley. Um, we had a very diverse team, both because we didn't only have one office here in San Francisco. Uh, that office in San Francisco, actually everyone on the team was of a different nationality. 
and we also had uh, two teams, one in, in Mexico City and one in Serbia, both development teams. And uh, even though our headquarters were here in, uh, in San Francisco, um, that was also the smallest team that we had here. So there were, were a couple of issues um, just to start with right from, from the beginning. Uh, when I came in, the first thing was that there was only one business slash marketing guy there when I got there. Uh, and the rest, about 20 people, were engineers and, and, and tech guys. Um, so they had been working on this facial recognition technology for forever. We're talking a couple of years already. Uh, and the team had started out pretty small and they had, they had grown and gotten a little bit of funding primarily from uh, the founder himself who who had a couple of successful ventures uh, to begin with. Anyways, what it um, evolved into was a, a facial recognition, social uh, media combination kind of app. Um, and, and the idea was to use facial recognition to identify people's friends, and then automatically, when you take a photo of someone, that photo would automatically be sent to your friend. Uh, the first issues came from the facial recognition technology itself. Although it was very accurate, uh, there was one place, and we didn't even realize this until after the app was launched, uh, that uh, dark-skinned African Americans, it, it didn't recognize their faces, period, at all. It just failed completely on them. So there you have one huge, uh, call it even, even a, a sort of political issue from the beginning, uh, and and uh, a lot of negative cr critique. The app was, was already on App Store already uh, at that time, and you started to see the, the criticism coming in. Early on, our, our average was 1.8 stars on the App Store, and we had probably spent <laughs> a couple million dollars on, on that app at that point. Um, but they started out developing facial recognition technology, and the idea of the whole company from the beginning was uh, to be like a, a privacy. They were, were going to be all about privacy. So when you got to that app, there was absolutely nothing, recon like you can couldn't recognize it at all from the initial idea. It had nothing to do with privacy. And, and later when I joined Apple, I, I realized that just because of privacy, uh, from because of privacy guidelines within Apple, uh, having that app approved in the first place was probably a mistake because the entire concept was <laughs> in violation of Apple's developer uh, agreements and, and, and guidelines. So um, a, a couple of things that I learned from that was first, the entire concept came primarily out of already having developed a, a facial recognition technology and not really knowing what you're gonna use it for. and the tech guys decided what they're going to use it for, and no one talked to the customers or potential users first. So that's an issue that we've already touched. Uh, another issue is that because teams were so separated, uh, they also worked on different parts of the app at the same time. So there was almost like silos of, of uh, call it departments in each of these locations. And just coordinating all of that Version work was, control. yeah, that was absolutely, it was extremely difficult. Uh, and we ended up flying back and forth uh, here and there, and, and that wasn't really viable either. So what I learned from that entire experience, I think, as we mentioned already, talking to customers and, and meeting them, uh, knowing that what you're doing is legal, or at least within uh, the restrictions of the platform that you're trying to enter, the App Store in this case. Um, and also uh, paying attention to uh, social, uh, potential social issues that could come up in this case, that the technology actually didn't work on a major part of the population because of their race. So uh, all of those things, like there are a lot of things to keep in mind while you're working on these ideas and the technology itself. You know, um, that's a good example, I think, because as have uh, others that you've had the panels given, <clears throat> a lot of business is about managing risk. Um, and you have to really do some hard work uh, to, to talk with your uh, potential clients and your vendors and 
your investors and everybody else who's a stakeholder to test your hypothesis uh, to make sure you know enough to manage the risk in a lot of cases. And that really does people in. Um, you know, we, we've only got a few minutes left before we take um, some questions, but um, if you had to give me a short answer, <laughs> Uh, what, what would you suggest as a way to manage failure if that happens? What would you, what would be your words of wisdom? Can you start, Dion? You don't have to do it in order. Go out over. Oh, you so somebody else. else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the best I heard was from Jeff Bezos at Amazon. And what he said is he has a two pizza one. And the two pizza is that he said if he starts any new idea, the group has to be small enough that they could be fed with two pizzas. And if it's any larger than that, it's too large. His thinking is, if you put a big team together, you're spending a lot of money, and it has an inherent thing that you have to keep it going. A small group, if you don't fund it very well, you wait until you see if there's traction, success, that pivot, and then you move ahead. So don't invest so much at the beginning that one, you've got to go back to your funders and say, well, I need more money because it's taking twice as long, it's costing three times as much, but you don't have to go back and explain how you really failed when you're pivoting, it was all there. But if you're small enough, you can move quickly. And he's a great example of a large company being able to come up with disruptive ideas. It almost never happens, yep. and he's able to do it. Anybody else want to volunteer? I recommend that you all play poker and learn what it feels when you lose everything and when you put everything on one card and you lose that hand. I think um, that really builds a muscle. It's not just a joke. I, I think um, any, any kind of strategy games like this actually prepare you. And then um, you need to know that you're going to hear a lot of no's in this journey. And because you're here, I bet that most of you here have heard a lot of yeses in your life. And being an A student and getting to the Austin Business Schools, et cetera, it's a way of yeses, right? But then you enter entrepreneurship and it's no, 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 no funding, no customers. 1.5 stars or whatever, seven stars on the App Store. And for, for you to not take that personally, which you will inevitably so in the beginning, takes takes you to build that muscle and also it takes for you to have a community that you can bounce that off of, like a personal board of advisors or a small community or mastermind group or, or alumni group here as well, where you feel safe and you can share those failures and you can get feedback and you can also, you know, sometimes you know, cry a little bit together or, you know, go go hit some boxing bags or whatever it, it needs to be for you to get over that. But it is psychologically very taxing. If your life has been like this, uh, you enter entrepreneurship and it starts going like that. And the highs are amazing and that's what, what we're in it for, I guess. But the lows are also pretty low. So, um, so build a support system around you. And I think there's amazing communities like Cult like uh, sort of base camp, like the guilt, where you can get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe. <coughs> excuse me. If I can add one thing, it's like as you mentioned, this whole customer effect that you guys go through uh, any startups. It's very, very uh, draining, uh, very difficult. Uh, and I think one thing that is very important to always keep in mind is like, why? Why are you launching this venture? Are you in it for the money? Are you in it because you're really providing a solution and a, and a service that is maybe changing the world, but at least doing something uh, that is like more than just uh, yourself? So this why, when you start any company, is very important. Uh, it will help you a lot to go through this roller coaster effect of high and down. Believe me, a lot of downs. Uh, the life is not Instagram. Everybody is uh, having a great time all the time. No, when you're entrepreneurs, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it can be very, very difficult. Uh, and I think that's important also try to keep it uh, also fun. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's important to, uh, business can be very uh, absorbing in terms of energy, in terms of like uh, time that you spend, especially at the beginning, because you need to do 
uh, many, many different uh, things at the same time. So there was like a super short deadline with like limited resource. So everything can be very uh, complicated. So believe on the why you're doing it. Take time for yourself, time to time as well. Uh, you have uh, an emotional bank account uh, and you need to reload it. Uh, because otherwise you won't be able to, to keep going in the long game. And uh, as uh, we were saying at the beginning, this 2.7 uh, time of failure before like, getting a successful business out of the ground. So next time, and believe me, I know what, uh, what it means. Uh, so have fun uh, as well, it's very important. Great, that was pretty much what I was gonna say too. The thing that intrigues me is, uh, it, I mean, but without a French accent, and <laughs> but, is uh, solving problems and coming at problems uh, from a different perspective if things don't work out the first go around, but having a sense of purpose and uh, having some impact in, in the world as well are very motivating for me, more motivating than the highs and lows, I think. But yeah, there are lots of those Goodbyes. Yeah, no, uh, I think I think uh, pretty much all the things that I can think of in terms of handling uh, failure has been mentioned. But one thing that I, I sort of wanted to get in here, uh, knowing the old community, having studied here before, in terms of you know getting into the community, the Silicon Valley community itself, um, there's something amazing about this place, this old community that is so incredibly diverse, and then there is. Uh, also one huge disadvantage, which is that um, it's sort of hard to get into the Silicon Valley environment just because this is a sort of cut off community. We're all from different parts of the world and uh, there are not many people from the US and there's at least very, very few people that have grown up or, or been in the Bay Area uh, before except for our, uh, professors. So um, one thing that I really encourage everything, everyone that attends Holt to do is to go out and attend networking events, uh, not just the ones that are hosted here on campus, which is obviously great as well to uh, meet your fellow students and people that come in from outside of campus here on campus. Uh, but there are so many events, so many things take, uh, taking place uh, outside of of Holt in this incredible Silicon Valley ecosystem uh, that you just have to tap into in order to really get the benefits of being here in the first place. Great segue to uh, Q&A. So we've got some very experienced people here and uh, go at it. Questions? Okay. Uh, you, you spoke about taking risks, but what differentiates risk from being rocked to go? Okay, because so the idea is too expensive to be exploited. What differentiates risk from being reckless? That's a great question. You know, go for it, but how do you stop yourself from being reckless? Anybody? Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> because this is that other voice, right? More of it. This is what I. But but the reality is there is a better recklessness in facing things that are risk oriented. You when you have to make decisions with imperfect information, that could be deemed as reckless. When I was talking about Jeff Bezos's idea, if you cut down the amount of investment that you're making at the beginning until you get some real feedback, that's one way to do it. It might be a reckless idea, but you aren't using the poker analogy. You're not putting all the chips in. You're just putting a few chips in to be able to do it. The second thing, of course, is in today's world, we've got so much in the way of digital marketing, whatever, doing A-B testing, doing a number of things online, move, removes the, the risk associated with trying something that's never been done before, because you know then when to double down. With the old uh, analog model, you basically would roll all the dice on a big ad campaign, and you probably spend all the money you have. And if it works, you're a hero. If you don't work, you're gone. So I think you use the new tools that exist to be able to do better and more definitive analysis of the effectiveness of what you're doing. You cut down the investment 
at the beginning on what you're putting into the company to be able to be there. And then what you do is basically recognize what happens across every single business. And that is it takes twice as long and it costs three times as much. So what you do is have a plan to get the additional capital or to be able to survive for the extra run to be able to get there. And about the only company that's really uh, skipped that was Instagram. And in what 17 months they're worth a billion dollars or something, but they were only worth a billion dollars because they were acquired by Facebook, and Facebook could do something with them. But the reality is, almost every other business has a product adoption cycle, the service adoption cycle, and that takes a while. It starts with the innovators, early adopters, and whatever. So you have to be able to weather the storm for a long period of time from a cash flow standpoint, and also from the standpoint of the mentality of your team. And I would add to that that um, even though I don't certainly don't believe in analysis paralysis, and I agree with you on that, I do think that one way to manage the risk is to really do some homework and understand your market, understand the growth factors, what's going on, and the, all the basic stuff that we all know. Uh, what what exactly is the definition of what you're trying to do, even though you may probably change it? You got to start somewhere and really understand where it is you're going as best you can. And lots of people just seem to just sort of say, you know, <laughs> let's go. Uh, and, I, and there are a lot of, so there are a lot of ways to manage risk before you start, as long as you don't stay in that stage way too long. Another question you have? Yes, you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add something regarding the, the first yes, question? Sure. Uh, I think which is also very important is like uh, for you to, as we mentioned, testing, uh, but also understanding the problem that you're solving and the solution that you're bringing. And out of that, to a part of the question is like, are you able to provide like a service that you're going to be able to monetize? Uh, today, like companies are only looking for calls. Uh, less and less VCs are investing in this kind of company because they want to see also money uh, coming into the company. So I think really like focusing at the beginning on that and uh, as has been mentioned, there's so many cheap tools today to really get a sense uh, of that. Thank you, first of all, for the amazing talk. Uh, you empower them to lead and you as a founder step back and you let them 
do the work and you trust them and that's the number one thing you need to do. It's very hard to step back from your product, from your baby sometimes when you have been the one programming and doing these things and letting other people uh, drive. But that's the skill you need to be able to step back and then let others uh, be the experts. I would add to that. I always say every entrepreneur needs to be uh, really good at sales, period, because you got to sell everybody you see. <laughs> whether they're employees, potential employees, uh, vendors, uh, customers, uh, funders, whoever it is, you're selling them. And you need to know how to do it. Yes. Yes. Hi. Thanks for giving me today. I'm also building a marketplace, so I wanted to ask if you could talk a bit about any non-scalable strategies you use there now to get connected and your effects. Non-scalable. Non -scalable strategies to get a network effect. Any ideas there? <laughs> well, the, the guild, right, as a marketplace, what we did at the very beginning is events, events, events. It's not scalable. Then you get people in the room, you build trust, and then you start to do referrals, and you try to create a viral ref referral strategy that these people then bring to their networks. We didn't spend a lot of money on marketing at all in the beginning. And when we tried Facebook ads and things like that, we saw it didn't work for us because you needed to have the trust in the community that that's the community you want to join. And it's very, very hard to build that online. Yeah, branding is important for that. You have to have those testimonials. But I definitely think the one-on-ones and then also being at events, speaking at events was extremely important. And then we did do a lot of interviews online on Medium, and that helped us a lot, much more than ads, to get our name out there. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you for the panel. Sorry for being late for a month, but I'm kind of curious on your opinion about the fact that founders are forced to spend most of their time outside of the office fundraising for their company. Kind of like your sort of start. Do you think that it's a negative trend or more of a You're making the observation that's not always true. It is always true. You're always fundraising, but not necessarily. That, I don't think that's that's just, yeah, yeah, you spend a lot of time fundraising, and it takes more and more time. Uh, anybody have any comments about that? <laughs> I just thought, I, I think it's beast, the nature of the beast. beast. But the one thing you need to do is make sure your team's still fired up and yeah. knows what they're doing. Yeah. I think Bill Gates said it best he, when he was asked what his role was at Microsoft from day one and, and until when he finally stepped away, he said, my job is very simple, is to have the vision and articulate it. And if you articulate it internally, you would develop the team around you and they can be smarter than you or, or not be smarter than you. But if, if they understand clearly what your raison d'etre is, the reason why you're there. Some will self-select and come with you and they'll stay with you. And then you're selling the same vision to the people on the outside. So that you're constant and consistent in the mission. It's just different audiences you're selling. You, you did catch selling the vision. <laughs> All right, somebody, yes. Remember that your business is not you. 
uh, and the challenge is like when you start a business, you put so much time and energy in there that you become, you think you become the business. So having families, friends around, and sometimes, you know, just like having fun and speaking about like completely different stuff than just business, tech, investors, investment, whatever, makes a lot of, uh, a lot of sense as well, you know, so. I think there is no real like uh, secret sauce. Uh, I don't think everybody is done for being an entrepreneur. Uh, let's be honest on that. It's, it can be very, uh, very challenging, but also super exciting. Uh, but I think everybody has the chance to try and to start. Uh, and you know, uh, companies, entrepreneurs needs also a lot of like talented people that uh, can uh, lead departments or do amazing stuff within a company without needing to start something and still be very successful and, uh, and meaningful in their life. Yeah, yeah um, I think, um, I, it's, it's been less than a year since I started my company now. I, I have lost track of how many times I've been pissed at myself because I made a huge mistake. Uh, or, or wasted time, um, and uh, I actually I had a meeting with Hap on Monday, and uh, he said one thing that I've been thinking a lot about afterwards, which is the importance of looking in the rearview mirror, and that is a way to motivate yourself and get yourself back up after you know experiencing failure, even if it's major failure, and you feel like you've had some success in the past. Look back at know, success in education or with other ventures, and also when you're looking at your own business and the business that you're running, if if you're having issues and you see those issues, you see, you know, an endless stream of, of issues and, and problems in front of you, which you always do, uh, this is also what, what Hap said, um, that, you know, you, you keep in mind that you've already solved countless issues and, and problems as well. So 